Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Peter's Highland United Church of Christ on this Sunday morning where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We're glad that you're here with us today to share this time of worship and prayer and reflection, and we look forward to spending this time together. As we prepare our hearts and minds for that time of worship and togetherness, let us hear now this morning's prelude. you to join with me in our responsive call to worship. Listen, Christ is teaching. We, we sit, sit at, at the, the feet, feet of our teacher. Watch, Christ is setting the captives free. In, in him we see the power of God. Rejoice, Christ is in this very room. We, we gather in awe and wonder. We continue our time of worship now, and I invite you to sing along with our quartet as they bring us this morning's hymn. <laughs>
friends, I invite you to join with me now as we share our unison prayer of confession. Faithful God, we have claimed to have more knowledge than we really possess. We have presumed to judge others on the basis of our limited understanding. We have grasped for freedom without taking full responsibility for our actions. By our actions, some of our sisters and brothers are excluded, some are misled, and some are unjustly accused. If we have violated another's conscience, if we have caused someone to fall, we are deeply sorry for failing to do all Christ expects of the church. We repent and seek your forgiveness. Amen. The psalmist knew that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but also that God is gracious and merciful and loving. Rejoice in the knowledge that our forgiveness comes from the Lord who loves us and leads us. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's time now for our children's moment. And so I invite all of the children that are with us today to check out this video. Hi, thanks for joining me today for our children's moment. Well, I have to tell you the truth. I had a really hard time coming up with what to talk about this morning for our children's sermon. None of the scriptures that we're going to talk about uh, in church really got me excited about something I could share with you. And and I don't know, maybe it's just the weather. Maybe it's this time of year. It's There's no more excitement about Christmas coming up. And, you know, it's kind of cold and wet and you can't go outside and all that kind of stuff. And I've just been feeling kind of down. I don't know. Maybe some of you have too. And um, I was really feeling bad for myself that I couldn't come up with a children's sermon message and um, struggling with other things. And I was feeling bad for myself. And suddenly a little voice inside of me said, remember, God loves you. And that was so powerful to me to, I know that. I say it all the time. We hear it all the time. But just to be reassured of that in that moment really helped me out and made me feel better. And so I wanted to share that with you today. First of all, to say God loves every one of you and there's nothing you can do about it. Isn't that great? I mean, that's about as simple as the message can be. But I wanted to to help you think about it in other ways. Um, I wanted to find a way to help you remember and hear that message every day because no matter what it is you're dealing with, no matter what's going on at school, no matter what's going on at home, no matter what's going on with with COVID restrictions and the weather, anything, God loves you. God loves all of us. So, you know, some people, this is kind of an old-fashioned thing, right? You tie a string around your finger to remind yourself of something. So you think, why did I tie a string around my finger? Oh, to remind me that God loves me. So I guess you could do it that way. But a lot of us now have phones or you probably have a a laptop or a computer of some sort that you use at school. They have calendars on them. Why not put a calendar entry in that pops up Every day. So when you click on that and you look at what you what's facing you for the rest of the day, there's a little message at the top that says, remember, God loves you. It's simple, but it can make a huge difference in our lives. And that's what I want you to remember today is that no matter what's going on, no matter how how life is treating you, God loves you. Why don't we have a prayer? God, we thank you so much for your love. We know that you're always there. We know that you're always there for us. Help us to remember that and remind ourselves of that love to give us the energy to get through what we're going through. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. Um, maybe the weather will clear up soon and get outside and get some fresh air. That'll help too. But in the meantime, remember, God loves you. I'll see you next time. As we prepare to enter into a time of prayer, as always, I invite you to center yourself, to still your mind and your body, to focus on your thoughts, to focus on the movement of the Spirit within you. So take a few deep breaths. Close your eyes if that helps you. Reflect on those things that inspire you and trouble you. And let us observe together a moment of silence as we enter into our time of prayer together. O oh God, we know that you call us to be a people of integrity. You call us to be people of passion and conviction. You call us to be like Jesus. And God, we long to live our lives with the same authority with which Jesus led his. We struggle to always present ourselves in a way that reflects your love for all of your children. Help us today and every day to be mindful of Christ's example of living his life the same way that he preached his message. Help us to become transparent in our motives and forthright in our intentions. Lead us to become more focused on your will for us, that through that focus, we might become better disciples of your love and grace. Make us implements of your service. Empower us to visit the sick that we pray for. Embolden us to be with those who are missing from our numbers. Lead us to live our lives as an offering to you. It is with that passion and integrity that we share now with you the deepest longings of our hearts during this moment of quiet reflection. For all of our prayers this day, we ask your blessing and your mercy. And we ask this in all things, in the name of your resurrected Son, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts, our debts as, as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Mark verses 21 through 28, and it reads this way. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They, they were astounded at his teaching, and he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. 
he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey, obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. When Christian Herter was governor of Massachusetts back in the 1950s, he was running hard for a second term in office. And one day, after a busy morning of chasing boats and missing lunch, he arrived at a church barbecue. Now, it was late in the afternoon, and Herter was famished. And as the governor moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman serving chicken. And she put a piece on his plate and promptly turned to the next person in line. Excuse me, the governor said. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm supposed to give each I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starving, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said again, only one to a customer. Now, Governor Herter was usually a, a, a modest and unassuming sort of man, but he decided that this time he would throw around some of his political weight. Do you know who I am? He said. I am the governor of this state. Do you know who I am? The woman said. I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. Well, we're talking about authority this morning. The gospel reading says that Jesus taught with authority in the synagogue and that he drove out a demon or an unclean spirit by that same authority. And I think the story about Governor Herder gives us something to think about today. There are generally two types of authority that a person can have. There's received authority, that is, authority that's conveyed by someone or something else. The governor in our story today receives his authority from the voters and from the state constitution and by the nature of the office that he holds. There's also autonomous authority, authority that is self-granted. The chicken lady in our story has granted herself the authority that she wields. But Jesus seems to possess a different sort of authority than either of those. In fact, the congregation at Capernaum noticed that he spoke that morning with authority but that it was a different sort of authority than the scribes and the priests had. There was something different about him. And I want to take a few minutes this morning to look at where that authority of Jesus comes from and what that means for all of us. Mark doesn't tell us what Jesus preached about that morning, but I suspect that what most of the congregation remembered from that day was Jesus' encounter with the unclean spirit. And so let's start by getting to the debate over exactly what that unclean spirit was. Some scholars suggest that it was a mental illness or a medical condition, like epilepsy. Other interpretations insist on it being an actual demon, some sort of malevolent spiritual being that ensnares human souls. And then there's the school of thought that spirits in the New Testament are metaphors for anything that might possess or control us. Things like anger, fear, lust, greed, hatred, envy. You get the idea. I don't know which of these explanations is true. But I don't think that it really matters for our purposes today either. What matters is how the Spirit utterly ravaged the poor man whose body and mind it possessed. As Debbie Thomas points out in her commentary on this passage, the man had no voice of his own, the Spirit spoke for him. The man had no control over his body, the Spirit convulsed him. The man had no community, the Spirit had isolated him. And the man had no dignity, the Spirit dehumanized him. 
Now, it's worth noting that this example of possession is an extreme case. But I suspect all of us have known what it's like when we fall victim to our own spirits or demons that take control of our lives and are too powerful for us to defeat on our own. It could be some sort of addiction. It could be an illness, physical or mental. I think even the current COVID pandemic might be an example of this, as it has altered almost every aspect of our lives in ways that are beyond our control and that are beyond our ability to escape. When we fall victim to those spirits in our own lives, the results can be discouraging and disastrous. But watch what happens in our story today. The unclean spirit goes to the synagogue. It recognizes Jesus' authority, realizes that Jesus is a threat, and it puts up a raucous fight to try to preserve its hold on the man that it possessed. But it recognizes Jesus' authority. How would an unclean spirit know Jesus? Jesus apparently preached a powerful sermon that morning, but the congregations the congregation weren't the only ones to hear him. Again, Thomas writes beautifully about what happened next. Jesus also spoke the unclean spirit's language, listened to its cries, and rebuked it for the sake of a broken man's health and sanity. Consider the question the spirit asked before it left its victim. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? There's only one answer to that question. Everything. I have everything to do with you. Wherever pain is, wherever darkness is, wherever torment is, God is. God has everything to do with us, even and maybe especially when we're at our worst, when the shadows overwhelm us, when the demons shriek the loudest, when the hope of liberation feels like nothing more than fantasy. That is when Jesus' authority brings the walls down. And that's the good news for us today, friends, that Jesus' authority is not the sort of authority that expects to be above the fray, that would ask for that extra piece of chicken that no one else got. And it's not some self-entitled spirit of authority that revels in its own cleverness. Jesus' authority comes from the fact that he is in the fear, in the sickness, in the depression and despair of our lives with us, And he's ready to engage anything that threatens to diminish the lives of those he loves. And, spoiler alert here, that means each and every one of us. Jesus amazed and astonished the crowd at the synagogue that day. And it's my prayer that he might amaze and astonish each one of us with the power he has in each of our lives, if only we are willing to surrender to freedom when Jesus offers it to us, even if the exit of our demons causes us hardship. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah.
again, I share with you um, our joy here at the church for your continued support of the work and ministry of this congregation during these most difficult times. We thank you for that support. Um, we remind you to only give if you're able, and also remind you that you're able to give uh, electronically through the link at the bottom of your screen, or by simply sending a gift to the church. We thank you for any and all ways in which you contribute to our ongoing mission in our community. Friends, we have been called to reach out in understanding, in service, and in love. Our morning offering will enable this church community to become a beacon of hope and wisdom and service to those in our community who so desperately need to see and hear it enacted in their very midst. May we together give generously of our offerings this day. Join with me now as we give thanks together using our prayer of dedication. By giving away some of the wealth we cherish so much, we keep ourselves focused on who you are, gracious God, and on what you expect of us. As the body of Christ, we seek to be a healing force in our world. May the offerings we present be used in ways that encourage helpful behaviors among us in the church, within our community, and as far as our influence can reach. Receive us and our gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may God bless you. May Christ love you. May the Holy Spirit fill you. Go now in peace. Amen.